or I don't. Excellent. We'll give it a sec. I don't expect others, but okay. Get my gavel out, make it official. And good evening. I'm going to go ahead and call this session of the City of Tumwater Hearing Examiner to order. For the record, today is October 25th, 2023 at 7 p.m. We have one item on the agenda this evening, and this is number TUM 231327, the Blomberg uh, Conditional Use Permit, and it involves a request for approval of a conditional use permit, or CUP, to operate a marijuana producer processor business in an existing uh, warehouse complex on an approximately 4.74 acre property at 9630 Blomberg Street Southwest here in the city of Tumwater. Uh, my name is Andy Reeves. I serve as the city's hearing examiner, and tonight it will be my role, uh, my job, to collect evidence in the form of exhibits and testimony to determine whether this proposal is consistent with the city's comprehensive plan, zoning ordinances, critical areas ordinances, and the specific criteria for approval of a conditional use permit under the municipal code. And then in this particular instance also, uh, that it meets the criteria that are specific to a marijuana business under section 1842080 of the municipal code. Uh, to that end, I received several exhibits I had an opportunity to review in advance of the hearing today. I believe the number is 11, but we'll verify that shortly with city staff. Uh, but these include a staff report prepared by staff, uh, the application materials themselves, including a narrative that was prepared uh, by the applicant, various uh, site information, including sort of an amended formal site plan, vicinity map, zoning map, etc. Uh, information on the review that occurred under our state's Environmental Policy Act, or SEPA, including the determination of non-significance, or DNS, that was issued uh, by the city and ultimately, I believe, was not appealed, but we'll also verify that. Uh, and then information on the notice that was provided in advance of the hearing, uh, and that was also notice related to the application as well as SEPA and the hearing. And then there were a few comments from reviewing uh, departments and agencies, uh, nothing sort of, I think, ultimately super specific to the project. We could talk about it, but uh, there were a, a few comments from agencies and I believe one public comment uh, from the public at large uh, that we could talk about and then some information about the code itself. So I'll go ahead and admit those 11 exhibits into the record. Should anyone have additional exhibits they would like admitted, let me know when it's your opportunity to testify, and I'll go ahead and address admitting additional exhibits at that time. All testimony tonight will be under oath or affirmation. That's because we're my decision to be appealed under our state's land use petition act or LUPA. Uh, the recording of today's hearing, as well as the admitted exhibits and my decision would serve as the foundation for any such appeal. I may and usually do ask questions of those that are testifying, truly not trying to trip anyone up, just trying to ensure I have a thorough understanding of the proposal so that I can issue a decision in a timely fashion uh, after the record closes uh, that is hopefully uh, not subject or it would be subject to appeal, but hopefully would not be appealed would be the way I would like to state that. So I think with that, we can go ahead and get started. From what I can see, we don't have any others that have joined us virtually, um, but we do have the applicant team in the room, and then we have planning staff with us as well. So I'm going to go ahead and swear in Tammy Merriman on behalf of the city, and we'll get started. So thank you for being here. Do you swear or affirm to tell truth and testimony you give here tonight? I do. And thank you. And if you could just state and spell your name and explain who you are. Sure. Thank you. My name is Tammy Merriman. I'm the permit manager for the city of Tumwater. My name is spelled T-A-M-I, last name Merriman, M-E-R-R-I-M-A-N. Thank you so much for being here. And did my rundown quickly of the exhibits track with what you were hoping I'd look at before tonight? <clears throat> yes, absolutely. Um, I do have one minor little fix. Um, I accidentally labeled one of the exhibits wrong. The electronic title of the exhibit is correct. Exhibit nine, the site plan review. If you look at it, the paper copy, it says exhibit 11 on the first page, <laughs> but it really is exhibit nine. Well, and hold on one sec. So the exhibit list 
in the PDF that I have, definitely exhibit nine is what you just stated in terms of formal site plan review approval. Yes. And then just checking exhibit nine in the staff report at the end also, correct? Correct. So I don't have a paper copy. So oh. if there was a mistake, uh, I never saw it. So let's strike that from the official record. Tammy made no mistakes. <laughs> Unlike some former uh, folks that had your job, uh, great when no mistakes are made. And with that, please proceed. Okay. Um, help myself. That that's great. Thank you. And and good evening, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, as the uh, Mr. Examiner said that we are looking today at a conditional use permit to operate a marijuana uh, producer processor facility at 9630 Blomberg Street in Tumwater. As part of this conditional use permit review, we also issued a SEPA determination and a formal site plan review approval for the site. I'll go into those details uh, later in my staff report. Um, but before I start, I always like to open um, my report with the city's public notice process to assure that we followed all of the appropriate um, requirements for public notice. So <clears throat> the conditional use permit application was submitted August 16th, 2023. The application was deemed complete on August 22, 2023. Uh, we, the city issued and distributed a notice of application with an optional DNS process um, this notice of application was mailed to property owners within 300 feet of the site, emailed to interested parties and agencies, posted on site on the city's website, and it was also published in the Olympian on August 31st, 2023. Following that, the DNS notice was the same issue. It was mailed to adjacent property owners, interested parties, posted and published in the Olympian on September 18th, 2023. And then notice for tonight's public hearing was mailed to adjacent property owners, interested parties, also those who commented on the notice of application and or DNS, and it was posted and published in the Olympian on October 13th, 2023. Um, as you... Sorry, I, I was just saying, great, thank you. Yeah, okay. it felt like a pause. I was just saying, yep, notice. I, I, I am aware. And, and so please, please continue. I apologize. Okay, that's fine. Um, and then as uh, stated, the review authority for a conditional use permit it falls under the purview of the hearing examiner. Um, as we uh, have said that the property is located at 9630 Blumberg Street. The zoning is light industrial. <clears throat> I'm going to share my screen just quickly here so that um, so that I can point when I talk. <laughs> That's fine. And I see um, it. So okay. just to be clear, this is an exhibit already in the record, and you're just sharing your screen as sort of uh, demonstrative or illustrative purposes. Is that right? Yes. Excellent. Um, okay. I'm pointing because I wanted just to bring the attention um, of where it's located on Blomberg Street and what it looks like around it. The existing zoning is light industrial. The property surrounding it are light industrial, with the exception of the property across the street, which is owned by Washington State DNR. It's currently used for agricultural, nursery, tree growing. Um, it's not in the city's UGA, so it is in Thurston County. As the examiner stated, the property is about 4.7 acres. It's relatively flat. There's so, three. And Ms. Mayor, I apologize to interrupt. What you just said, I hadn't thought about, but then it popped into my head, which is the fact that the property that is owned by, you said, is it DNR? Mm -hmm. Is that right? Correct. I believe so. Is not within the UGA means the likelihood that it would change hands and be residential is much lower. Is that maybe an accurate thought in terms of what a UGA does in many instances? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Just, please, a... <laughs> please speak on. I, oh man, we're not, we're, we are off <laughs> tonight, but uh, go ahead and speak to that if you could. Sure. The zoning is rural residential, one unit to 10 acres. Um, it has been owned by and used by the Washington State Department of Natural Resources for a very long time. Um, if it were to develop, it would be a very rural residential zoning, um, but it would not be subject to urban densities. And the fact that it's not designated within the UGA means that it has not been set aside as an area that 
the city of Tumwater and the county and you know the powers that be have said, hey, this is the kind of place we would like high density residential mixed use development as we plan for the future. Correct. Correct. And okay. and and also we are not able to annex property in if it's not within our UGA. So even coming into the city to get um high density residential or urban zoning is very unlikely. Excellent. And I asked that and maybe you'll touch on it, but the type of use involved here is there are a few specific things that need to be checked out. And so with that, I'll let you continue. Apologize for interrupting. No, no, no problem. Thank you. Oh, okay. So right now, as you can see here on this photo, it's, it might be kind of small. There's three existing buildings. Currently, um, the building on the east side of the property um, is under current um, with this own, with this applicant under current use as a producer processor, marijuana producer processor. That was approved in the county before the property was annexed into the city. The applicant wants to move and expand his business to include the center building here and the building on the left um, with future expansion. And in order to do that under city regulation, it requires a conditional use permit. And that's why we're here today. Um, Producer processors are allowed as a conditional use upon the granting of a conditional use permit by the hearing examiner. The conditional use uh, criteria in, in Tom Otter's municipal code has a list of things that the city needs to review to make sure that it meets those. Um, we reviewed and provided analysis of that and I'll go over them briefly. I also want to say that um, the applicant's representative also provide an excellent analysis with his uh, narrative and application. And I was pleased that we both came up to the same conclusion. So he's he's got some information in there that I might have not necessarily written, but he did a really good job. I didn't feel I wanted to plagiarize everything he said. <laughs> um, so the Thank you. Please continue. Okay, some of the criteria for uh, granting the conditional use permit is uh, first, the use shall meet the goals and policies of the Tumwater Comprehensive Plan, including any sub area plans and, uh, and applicable ordinances. So we did our review, the site is uh, designated as light industrial. The land use element of the comp plan provides for the location of um, a broad array, array of activities in this area, including manufacturing and other industrial development. So our analysis is that the project is an industrial use, it's surrounding by existing industrial uses and is consistent with the comp plan or the comprehensive plan land use plan. It is also falls within the neighborhood appendix to the comprehensive plan, the Southwest Tumwater neighborhood. And it, it, that envisioned this area specifically, and that's why I made this picture quite large, is it includes this area because it has great access to I-5, the property is relatively flat, there's good access to the airport if needed, um, and municipal utilities are available. So the staff has found that um, that meets uh, it's consistent with the comprehensive land use neighborhood, um, Southwest neighborhood. The properties uh, for zoning is located in the light industrial zone, which does allow marijuana producer processor within a fully enclosed secure indoor structure only as a conditional use. They are proposing to put the uses within the existing buildings. Um, so it's consistent with the zoning there. The secondly, we need to look and make sure that the use is not materially detrimental to public health or welfare environment, including things like noise, noxious or offensive odors and things like that. So the, um, after review, staff has looked at it and it's proposing to occur, entire, like I said, entirely within the enclosed buildings. Um, HVAC equipment is located outside of the buildings and um, with engineered odor control system. And then this, um, following up the use is similar to the existing uses. So it's consistent um, or that it's not producing material or materially detrimental issues. Um, available availability of public services. The site is already served by city water. The site is on a septic system. And um, I believe that the applicant will provide um, um, later tonight the actual uh, response from the county that shows that the septic system is adequate for the, pro the uses, uses proposed. And then uh, city will uh, serve it with police and fire. 
The site has existing perimeter landscaping. Um, it doesn't propose to add any additional landscaping, nor at this time is it really required. They are, however, proposing to do a wood fence um, to provide screening for the mechanical, mechanical equipment at the property lines. Um, the third in this list is to that the use shall meet, it, meet or exceed required standards for the zoning district. And the proposal, we believe, as conditioned by the formal site plan review approval, which I'll talk about in just a, just a moment, uh, meets the zoning requirements of Chapter 18.24. Finally, the last criteria is that is there, is there any additional minimum conditions identified for a particular use? Um, and that analysis for the particular use of marijuana producer processor is found later in the report. So the staff has found that it, the proposal as condition meets the um, requirements of the criteria for a conditional use permit. Okay. Those being the general requirements that you just ran through. Yes, general criteria, yes. Understood. Then moving into zoning, um, the property, as I said, is light industrial zone, which allows the marijuana processor producer within fully enclosed structures um, as a conditional use. The staff has already found and the applicant is proposing to operate within the fully enclosed structures. Conditions for the marijuana producer processor specific uses in the conditional use permit refers to section um, 18.56220 of the Tumwater Municipal Code. And those are specific minimum requirements for a marijuana processor. And those are that the applicant meet Washington State licensing requirements. The applicant has an existing active license at this site for a non-retail cannabis per processor. Um, they will have to show and demonstrate that if there's any additional requirements from the state with the addition or expansion of the buildings, um, they would have to show that prior to certificate of occupancy. They need to comply with all building fire safety health codes and business license requirements. Our analysis shows that the applicant ha currently has an active city of Tomwater business license for the existing building. We will need to make sure that the, ad the additional buildings are added to that um, application or that building pardon me, that business license. And then also any improvements that are going to be made to the um, additional buildings um, must come in for a building permit, tenant improvement permit to make sure that it meets building codes. Um, the uh, next... oh, sorry, the section you're discussing, I, I had a different, and I think your staff report says, but 1842.080 as the specific marijuana business criteria. I think you may have referenced something else. I just want to make sure I'm not saying. No, and I this threw me off a little bit. The condition, when you go to the condition and use chapter in the Tomwater Municipal Code 1856, it talks right. about specific, specific uses. So 18.56.220 is marijuana uses. It says under those specific criteria that it has to meet the minimum conditions of 1842.080A. So it, oh, okay. it just sends oh, you, it just so sends you is, here. <laughs> it, it's the, the sort of definition almost, right? It's there's the B section is 110, C section uh -huh, is correct. Okay, so then I then went to the more specific 42080. So we're, we're both right. I just wanted yes. to make sure I wasn't looking at the wrong thing. Okay. No, thanks. and I wanted to make sure that I, because when you look at the conditional use chapter 1856, it's for M uses for marijuana processor, it actually states it, but it refers you to 1842 that it has to meet these minimum conditions. We're on the same page. Okay. Just want to make sure there wasn't a whole different section that I was unaware of. So please well, continue. I panicked and thought I missed it. So I'm, <laughs> I thought I needed to clarify it, maybe just for my own self. <laughs> um, moving on to those um, specific minimum conditions, um, we need to make sure the lot size, building size, setbacks, and lot coverage conforms to the standards of the zoning district. Um, the structures are existing and they do meet those uh, standards. Signage, if any, would conform to um, the uh, city's sign code, eight, 
chapter 18.44. Um, they're not proposing any new signage, but if they did, it would have to make sure that it me it's com in compliance with city code as well as Washington State Cannabis Board, cannabis board requirements for signage. Um, the use has to be fully enclosed in a secure indoor structure. They have proposed that it meets that requirement. All the buildings must be equipped with ventilation air filtration systems so that no odors are detectable at the property line. They're proposing those, um, as I stated earlier, the HVAC equipment that does that. We need to make sure that all buildings that are associated with this production of marijuana um, be set back more than 300 feet from our residential zones, the um, residential, um, pardon me, sensitive resource, our single family, medium family, our medium density, mixed use, um, brewery district, so forth, um, and the manufactured home zone. And we did the measurement and it is, it's located outside of that 300 feet. So it meets that requirement. And then lastly, that the city could suspend or revoke a conditional use permit based on the finding that the provisions of this section haven't been met. So these above provisions are listed among the conditions of approval of this use permit if approved by the hearing examiner. Great. Did that conclude your, your comments? On that, I, do, I was just going to briefly go over public comments. Oh, please, please do. Okay. Um, we did receive public comments um, from the Notice of Application and SEPA. The Nisqually Indian Tribe and the Squaxin Tribe both said they had no specific concerns. The Washington State Department of Ecology had some concerns on um, possible contamination on an adjacent site. It didn't really apply to this, but they also had comments on, comment on the determination of non-significance, suggesting a requirement to, to determine management of waste if and when generated. And I believe that um, the applicant is going to provide um, some back and forth conversations they had with Department of Ecology, assuring them that that waste was not going to be generated and Department of Ecology was good with that. The comment we received from the um, public actually, um, someone, Carly commented that she was concerned about the odor, that when she drives in this general area, it smells most of the time. Um, there's other producer processors in this area. Some of them are been there for a while. I'm sure that over time, um, either HVAC equipment is not working specifically or maybe it's not as good as it is now. Um, so I am confident that the, the, the newer engineered odor control is going to be fine and meet the state regulation. And that we'll just try to catch up with these others if, if there is problems and bring them into compliance. I did and, respond to her with that that comment. Sure, and I guess to that end, not just this property, but generally speaking, were this were that to become sort of a problem, as it were, you had said in terms of the recommendation by the city for this permit, the idea that a CUP can be revoked. But prior to that, is there a code enforcement process or some system in place whereby you know, the, the city has the ability to, you know, fine or, or get other agencies involved to make sure that that HVAC equipment is, is up to snuff, as it were? Yes, there is a code enforcement process for that because it wouldn't meet code. Um, we also have state requirement that it is not supposed to have odor at the edge. Um, I've not experienced that, but I know that there would be a process for it. And then I think the first thing is to make, make sure that we know which facility the odor is really coming from because there's many in that general location. Yeah, odor like noise can be a challenge in yeah. terms of, you know, where it's Measuring coming at from. the property line, yes. Right, <laughs> there, there's a process one way or the other is what you're, even if the, even if you, at a minimum, someone involves and talks to the agencies because this is a highly regulated industry. You know, there are, there are agencies that that focus on on this type of use, obviously. So, uh, point being, those systems exist is is what I'm asking, and the answer seems to be yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. It does. Excellent. So, uh, please. One more one more thing, and then I'll just. Um, list the, the recommendation here. The last thing that I'd like to say is that the city did review this project under the um, site plan review. 
we issued a formal site plan review decision and that review includes conditions of approval um, and the review included things like parking, landscaping, critical areas, transportation concurrency, building code requirements, street water and sewer. Um, and along with that, um, there is a condition in that formal site plan review that it is subject to the approval of a conditional use permit by the hearing examiner. So that's listed in there. I Got was con it. I was contacted. Um, there is one question that the applicant has on a condition in there about landscaping. And um, it says that detailed landscape plans are required to be submitted with a site development and grading permit. The intent of that was if they have to go there, that would be a part of it, but they, but I don't believe that they're going to be put in a position at any time where they'd have to submit that site development and grading. They're, um, they're not gonna have to do frontage improvements. So I don't believe it, it's going to apply, but it is written in there that it says a detailed landscape plan is required. So I would just like to clarify that if they do landscaping, if they propose to change their landscaping, or if they have to submit site development and grading plans, for frontage improvements for some strange reason in the future, then it would apply at that time. Just to be clear, what we're talking about, the condition you're referencing is a condition that has been imposed on the site plan review SPR decision that was an administrative decision that I, the hearing examiner, did not produce. Sometimes they get consolidated and sometimes okay. I it gets bundled. This was not a bundle situation. So you are now clarifying that, I guess, and we can get the applicant's thoughts. I guess one idea would be, should there be something, an additional condition to clarify kind of if there were a change that would lead to A would lead to B or X lead to Y, uh, to the extent that, you know, I don't know what authority I have or, I know I can condition this permit, but the SBR is not in front of me. It's not even in the record that I have, but go ahead. Well, it is kind of in the record because um, as one of the recommendations um, it, to you from city staff is that the formal site plan review approval with conditions is referenced and considered conditions of this approval. That means that their conditional permit is can they go together even though it was reviewed just decision made it's referenced here we just want to make sure that well to that extent then could we proposed condition proposed meaning i the hearing examiner can alter these conditions that have been recommended uh in the staff report that does reference site plan review approval i guess one option would be to to add some language that clarifies the intent of that condition in the SPR. And that I, would, I think, solve the problem okay. in my mind, but your thoughts? I, yeah, I will let the applicant's representative chat with you about that. Um, I, I, it's a standard comment that's always made. And, and I think it, it's really a word of if, if this is submitting, it would be required, but that's not what the, the, condition says. So I'm going to let you have him explain that to you and, and their concern with it. Um, okay. I am confident that that I wouldn't require a detailed landscape plan moving forward at this point after if this approval is given, I'm expecting a tenant improvement permit and they'd be moving forward without. Which, I love the idea. I understand. I hear what you're saying. But Sometimes people leave their current place of employment, they win the lottery or <laughs> they move to Hawaii or I don't know what happens. And so, you know, I, I understand an applicant being nervous or concerned about the exact, you know, missing two, two letters. Gotcha. That said, I do have a couple questions before we, we head okay. to the applicant, but are you, did that conclude? Your that does. The rest of the recommendation to you is basically calling out those specific criteria for the conditional use permit. Um, nothing else is called out there. So that is the end of my presentation. And I absolutely agree that um, it, it this should be clarified. And enough so that I, that's why I brought it up. I want to let you Thank know you. that we are good with that. 
I appreciate it. And and I I think everyone wishes that you win the lottery or any of us uh, <laughs> so that if if anyone leaves their current employment, it's it's for good reason. But uh, that said, um, just a few quick questions. Uh, so thank you. We'll, we'll try to get to the bottom of recommended condition one. You kind of already discussed, and I think in this case, it's actually pretty well laid out. And the idea being that there's multiple sort of agencies involved in a use like this. And so often a conditional use permit can be transferred from one property owner to a new you know, buyer. I think based on my review of the recommended conditions, it's pretty clear that if someone else were to purchase you know, the, the property that the use could transfer so long as they, they have all the appropriate licenses uh, you agree that that's the intent of, of condition two in particular. I, yes, I agree. Excellent. Okay. A lot of people miss doing that in the last several years. So I just wanted to point out good job folks for, for recognizing that that's important. Um, and then kind of specific Back to SEPA, you, you, there were no appeals of, of the DNS, correct? Correct. But I wanted to ask the language of the SEPA uh, DNS that was issued. Let me find it. Sorry. Uh, that was seven, eight. Which exhibit was it here? Seven. Exhibit seven. Uh, so the the optional process was used. So notice of the threshold determination was provided with notice of the application. Great, uh, which allowed for the comment period, and we had a comment or two. Uh, then independently, this DNS had, was issued, and that was issued on September 18th. Uh, and that was the DNS that essentially said, you know, the lead agency has determined there will be no significant impacts, et cetera. My question is, the appeal period that, that is noted here is only seven days. I think under your own municipal code, 14 is the number. I don't think this has a major dramatic impact. I, I just wanted to point out that you can say that there were no comments about SEPA. No one was saying, hey, I really wanted to appeal SEPA. I mean, clearly we've had long enough that if someone seemed to have a concern, they could have raised it. But I, I just wanted to sort of point this out just so that it's on the record. But I believe under the municipal code, let alone SEPA itself, uh, 14 days, I think, is required under 1604-160 of your own code. Well, I was looking at 1604-160, and it says all appeals should be in writing, um, and any appeal must be filed within six calendar days of the SEPA determination being final. Well, I'm sorry, maybe I missed that. Number three, so we have to have the 14 day comment period. Normally, that was done with the notice of application. So the appeal has to be filed within six calendar days of the determination being filed. I actually extended it one day because of the um, holiday. Sorry, where are you? Where's the six days? How did I miss? 1604-160. Yeah. Number three, A3. A3, okay. Oh, any appeal? Sorry, okay. My apologies. I, where did I get 14? I apologize. I... It's... Okay, sorry. That, that I didn't think it was a problem either way. So number two has a 14-day um, appeal process, but that was an appeal if at the beginning if, if the director decides whether an EIS is required or not required. Oh, then wow. they could appeal that decision in 14 days. Number three is an actual appeal of the SEPA determination. Uh, yeah. My apologies. I I was I read too closely. Uh, I okay, six days. I don't know what SEPA itself says about that, but point being ultimately nobody expressed any concern or desire to appeal this. Just correct. Okay, so uh, let me take my foot out of my mouth and move forward. 
Um, I really think we covered that, 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 and that. I think that's truly all I had. Um, so nothing further required that, that I had intended on asking you. Did you have any other members of staff you intended on calling upon? Nope, I don't think so. I think uh, the staff report has covered everything and look forward to hearing from the applicant. Excellent, thank you so much. Okay, with that, we'll turn to our applicant representative. Uh, and we have someone on behalf of the applicant. Okay, we'll get you sworn in. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in any testimony you give here this evening? I do. Thank you. Could you state and spell your name for the recording? You bet. My name is Chris Carlson, spelled C-H-R-I-S, last name C-A-R-L-S-O-N. I'm a consultant that for the applicant that works for Hat and Goat at Pantier. Our address is 3910 Martin Way East, Suite B, Olympia, 98506. Great. Thank you, Mr. Carlson, for being here. And I do note for the the record that Mr. Carlson at one point uh, served uh, as the city of Tumwater's uh, current use planning manager. Is that correct? Uh, permit manager, but yeah, Tammy's position. Tammy Merriman's position. And uh, to be perfectly honest, I think it, that makes him appearing even more difficult because, uh, you know, he gets hammered to make sure that, you know, not trying to cut any corners. But uh, uh, Mr. Carlson, thank you for being here. And I'll let you proceed at this point. Well, thank you, uh, Examiner Reads. First of all, I'd like to uh, introduce the rest of the applicant team. To my left, we have uh, Mr. True Din. He's uh, part of the ownership group. And then we have Mr. Omid Pazuki. He is actually the current operator of the uh, Eastern Building, as Tammy indicated in her staff report, that is a currently licensed 502 facility. And Mr. Pazuki uh, is the operator of that facility, and he will be the operator, hopefully, if we can get this approved and the TI's uh, tenant improvement permits uh, approved, he'll be the operator of the other two buildings as well. Great. Thank so. you both for, for being here, and, and maybe you'll clarify, but that was a uh... Earlier permit, as Ms. Merriman pointed out, that was received by the county uh, and apparently has been operating, you know, without issue since. Uh, and now we're looking, the applicant's looking to expand, and now the property is within the city. But I'll let you explain all that, Mr. Carlson. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Well, first of all, thank you, Tammy, for a very thorough staff report. I appreciate that. I appreciate the the clarifications um, on the uh, mislabeled exhibit, at least on my paper copy, I think I'm the one that brought that to your attention. Um, and uh, the clarification on the landscaping, maybe that's a good place to start. Um, I think that does need to be clarified. Um, you know, the way the condition is written in the formal site plan uh, approval letter, which again, Tammy has, or the city has, uh, incorporated into the conditions of approval for the conditional use permit, um, I think that does need to be clarified. Um, the condition, I believe, says that um, it will be required if a site, grade, site development grading permit is required. I don't believe that's the case. Um, the trigger, at least my reading of the code, is that the trigger for landscaping, a landscape plan that meets the city's code requirement is if um, uh, improvements to the site equal or exceed 25% of the assessed valuation of the buildings on site. And so maybe that's a starting point for a revised condition or an additional condition. Um, we do not meet that. Um, we've uh, There's another trigger too. I'm not, don't, don't wanna get off track here, but that's there's a mirrored, uh, uh, condition that the city has in their development guide for a public work standard that's similar. It says if you exceed 25% or more of the assessed valuation of the buildings on site, then you have to do frontage improvements. We've already gone through that exercise with public works and demonstrated to public works that the value of this um, 
tenant improvement. Again, it's just interior tenant improvement and some uh, HVAC work on the two buildings, the center one and the western one, add HVAC equipment outside does not meet that 25% um, threshold. So um, I don't know what your thoughts are on that, Tammy or, sure. or Examiner Reed. Well, and from my end, I, I maybe I misspoke earlier. I apologize to the extent that the site plan review approval that we're discussing is that Exhibit Eleven. I just sometimes it's not okay. Th there's a letter that's provided, which you know, Tammy Merriman, can you clarify the difference between that letter and what would be the SBR? Correct. The site plan review approval is Exhibit 9. It is physically labeled Exhibit 11. Oh, okay. So, okay. Uh, I can share the screen if you'd like to see it. I, I get it. But my point is, okay, so it is, there's a labeling thing, but but you have it in my record. Is yes. What, yes, you it. have it as ex Exhibit 9. And, and since the microphone's back to me, I see where the confusion lies um, because sure. it actually, the the condition says that a detailed landscape plan should be submitted with building permit application for any updated landscaping or proposed screening. So to me, if they were going to up, if they had to, if they were going to do landscaping, we would require a detailed landscape plan. They're going to provide screening our conversation now, Chris, is coming back to me more, is sometimes somebody says they're going to screen with a fence and we don't know what that is and does it meet the screening criteria, you know, for that. And so I just thought that we would be able to see with a plan what they propose, if they're going to change their landscaping or how they're going to perform their, per, perform, ah, provide their screening. That was the intent of that condition number 10. But just to be clear, so we're looking at the condition. So it's exhibit nine, not 11, just so that's clear. And I do have it in the record. I And that's, you know, my apologies for stating otherwise. Um, but the condition in that administrative approval under discussion is, is sort of 10. I mean, the language that is being discussed, sorry, is, Wait, no, did I mess that up already? Oh, sorry. Uh, no, parking lot light. Yeah, 10. Okay, I had it right. Um, what I was going to say was, I, I guess in my mind, is the term detailed landscape plan sometimes means in my mind something different than a landscape plan, it, meaning it can be a, something that needs to be produced by an engineer or someone with expertise, uh, a landscape, you know, uh, expert versus uh, to the extent that I, I, I guess I can see the applicant's point of if they're proposing, uh, you know, screening of some kind of fence, does that mean they need a quote detailed landscape plan for the entire site versus this is the fence we're proposing to, two different things in my mind, but are you reading it differently, Tammy Merriman? No. Um, <laughs> if they were going to, if they were going to propose screening for landscape or landscaping for screening, they would have to provide a detailed landscape plan. And generally that does come from a landscape architect, but they don't need, to, they're not required to do landscaping. So, but they are proposing screening. So uh, to me, it's a common sense thing that it wouldn't be a detailed landscape plan by an architect showing the screening, but they would explain what their screening was. And they have via email said that they were going to do or intended to do a cedar fence. But sometimes, like you said, if you say one thing, somebody might look at it or, or think of it something different. I've seen screening fencing well, that doesn't really screen in the past so <laughs> well and not just from the lawyer lawyers being the worst right yeah. if you read this sentence a certain way right a detailed landscaping plan shall be submitted for a or b right a or b so b being proposed screening so if you propose screening you then shall submit a detailed landscape plan lawyers being annoying one could understand that 
making sure some lawyer doesn't get involved clarification is is potentially not a terrible idea yeah. no i think it's fine and <laughs> yeah, that's okay. that's why i brought it up i don't have a problem i think we all want the same thing yep, and just go. the wording says kind of something different of course excellent okay um so i, I know we kind of went all over there but chris carlson we'll go back to you y your thought there i i guess i'm just trying to think of a sim the simplest way forward mr carlson i don't think we need oh. To, to change or do a new condition that goes into if this triggers this, if that triggers that, I think there's probably a way to produce a, a clarification even on proposed condition one that can solve it, but, but I'll let you give me your thoughts. Yeah, there. that's fine. I mean, I think, thank you. And thank you for that. I think, uh, I mean, the, the thing that caught my attention and I'm, I'm referring exhibit nine, which is labeled as exhibit 11, <laughs> the site plan approval letter. Um, yeah. On condition 10, the first sentence says a landscape plan showing proposed plantings, tree heights, and, and heights and other ve vegetation is required. Well, in this case, it's not required. Oh, sorry. Your problem was not even the thing I thought the problem was. Got it. Right. What I'm saying is that a landscape plan based on the city code and the trigger for landscaping with the 25% rule in 1847, I believe, um, of the municipal code uh, is not being triggered with this project. And so it's really that first sentence that I have a problem with. Um, you know, we do on our site plan, which is labeled as exhibit uh, three, we do provide a call out note there. Tammy, you and I had talked about this solid wooden fence to screen the HVAC equipment um, along the property lines. And, and I thought Tammy thought that was a little bit too squishy in terms of, okay, wood fence, what is it? Is it going to be, uh, you know, what, what's that? What is that? And we had uh, gone back and forth via email and um, I clarified in an email. And I suppose I could provide that in the record that it would be a cedar fence. We would do a cedar fence. Kind of look into my clients here, making sure that, I mean, that's what we had talked about is a solid cedar fence for the screening. So maybe what we do, uh, and I don't know the procedural stuff about striking a sentence in a administrative decision that was made by city staff, but since I guess it's incorporated in as a condition of, I don't know, I'll look to you as the, well, as the legal, me, legal I'll officer. stop you there. I, this is a little like what happens with SEPA, you know, I, as the hearing examiner, if it hasn't been appealed to me and it's not part of a consolidated hearing, I'm wary of altering a decision that wasn't appealed that said as the hearing examiner i think i have the authority in this instance to clarify as part of a condition on the cup but just to be clear i you you took me in a different direction and i want to make sure that staff is on the same page because i thought the issue really was do you need a full landscape plan just because you're putting up a fence not so much the, the other what you discussed in terms of the first sentence let me find it now i'm trying to go back to where i was here a yes, landscape sir. plan showing proposed plantings tree types heights if required that's is that the sentence you're talking about Ms. Carlson? Ms. Yeah. mr examiner yeah oh, sorry tammy merriman has a thought here is it possible for us to just amend um, outside of the hearing and outside of it, we just I make would... an amendment between us um, yep. after the fact. It's not an appeal; it's an amendment. We can do that. I can. I mean, it is referenced in this, but if it references back to the the approval, we can show that that approval has since been amended. So I yeah. I am happy to go that route. There you go. I was going to say one option would be for me in my decision to essentially you all could sort it out before my decision is issued, but me to say and amend recommended condition one to the extent that, you know, 
uh, formal site plan, you know, you have to adhere to that approval dated October 13th or as further amended or agreed to by the applicant and staff, you know, and leave it at that. And then you sort it out, meaning I'll give the discretion to you all because I'm confident this is not the kind of thing that would lead to denial of a conditional use permit for the use. <laughs> that makes sense. I, I, because yeah, otherwise yeah. I feel like we're getting in the weeds. Yes. Uh, okay, let's plan on that. So to be clear, yes. you all can work on this independent of me. I don't need any, you don't need to send me anything. We don't need to leave the record open. But for the record, my intent is to amend what has been recommended as condition one to acknowledge that this happened and there was, you know, it'll be in the testimony findings as well, but acknowledge that the parties agreed, you know, to, to, to work this issue out that really truly is not going to be a major deciding point. Uh, so if we're all good with that, we can move on. <laughs> Sounds like yes. Thank okay. You. Excellent. Yeah, with that, go ahead. That. And thanks for that suggestion, Tammy. Um, I just thought I'd add a couple of other things. Um, talk about the, and T Tammy alluded to it in her uh, presentation, but um, the site is actually, she said that the site served by a septic system. There's actually three septic systems on this site. Did you want me to pause there? Yeah. Well, that was something I was sort of curious about uh, to the extent that septic for an industrial area is not totally the norm, but go ahead and speak to, you know, more, more septic systems that are functional than fewer is good, but I am a little bit surprised that this is not yet part of any kind of municipal system, but with that, go ahead. Yeah, actually, um, there is three septic systems. There's one for each building. Uh, they were approved, um, you know, when the buildings were built. I think that the buildings were built, I believe, in 2005, I believe, um, somewhere around there. And when it, it was in the urban growth boundary, but it was under county jurisdiction and there was no sewer. So the sewer, actually, just to let you know, um, there is no currently no sewer available to this site. Um, the site. Uh, the sewer was brought over to the west side of Interstate 5 uh, as a collaborative effort between the developer that did the large Costco warehouse distribution center on the east side of I-5 there in the southeast quadrant of the interchange. The uh, Chehalis tribe who developed the new truck stop and convenience store there in the southwest quadrant and Kaufman Development, uh, Kaufman Construction, Inc., who did the subdivision, uh, which you actually, I believe you presided over that one. Well, these are familiar uh, the to me. Yeah. yeah, so at the northwest corner. So sewer was brought over uh, in a collaborative effort amongst those three developers. It is not currently available now. Now, it's my understanding, and maybe Tammy um, can, can add more to this, but there is a property. Tammy, do you mind bringing up the, um, the map that you were sharing? Well, and, and while she does that, Mr. Carlson, you, your applicants are not building any new structures, correct? That's correct. No, okay. this is all interior. Basically, they're building grow rooms, and if you want some specific information on that, uh, no, no, I'm true just or reading, they're they're within the the currently, you know, built out area. So I I I, I appreciate the the information certainly, but okay, I'm not overly concerned. It's just you know good to know that there's a plan moving forward, and I'll let you continue. Sorry. Okay, well, I, I won't talk about about sewer anymore. We are on septic. There is no city sewer available. One of the things that the city asked us to do and is actually a condition of approval was to ensure that those septic systems could handle the change of use of these particular buildings. And so uh, the owner um, hired Kevin Hughes, who's a uh, civil engineer that does 
septic design. That's kind of his specialty. And we tasked him up to prepare an application to submit to Thurston County Environmental Health, uh, requesting um, an evaluation uh, of, those, of those existing systems. Uh, his uh, narrative, if you will, the application included uh, a description of the operation. Um, and we have a letter that I would like to admit into the record uh, from the Thurston County Environmental Health De uh, Department, um, basically saying that uh, the septic systems are approved, but there's a condition on that. They're approved for a maximum of 32 employees. Excellent. So we'll make that exhibit. That's, that's, that's how they, I'm sorry, that's how they do, to do septic approvals for commercial uses. It's not based on number of bedrooms like a, like a residential use, it's based on employees. Sure. So it's anyway, good. I'd like to admit that to the record. I think I might have already given that to the city, but I'll go ahead and hand that to Alex. Right, and we'll make that um, exhibit, exhibit 12. Thank and you. Then, yep, okay. And then uh, just to be clear, this issue, the issue in question was brought up by DOE and and you've gone through, but it's Department of Health at the county that ultimately tracks the particular issue in question, what, it, correct? Yeah, that's correct, yep. yeah. Which is what the letter is uh, addressing. That is correct. Excellent. So another um, thing that Tammy alluded to during her staff presentation, was the um, comment that was received from the Department of Ecology regarding toxic waste and disposal of toxic waste. And so I contacted um, the uh, staff member from the Department of Ecology, Mr. Garrett Peck, uh, who works for the Toxic Waste Division of the Department of Ecology. Uh, I had a conversation with him um, about the comment. It was just kind of a general comment, as as you know, college's comments on these types of things typically are. Um, and his main concern, and actually, it's expressed in the in the comment letter that's part of the record from Mr. Peck, um, is that uh, the extraction process. I don't know if you're familiar with marijuana and production and all that stuff, but the um, the extraction process. There are, and I don't know much about it, and maybe Omid can speak to it okay. if you have specific questions as the operator, but you, there's certain types of chemicals and that sort of thing that are used in that process, and that was the, the crux of the comment from the Department of Ecology. Uh, this particular operation, the, the existing operation and the future operations in the other building, there is no current plan to do extraction. This is uh, grow. Uh, only and and processing and production of of the flour, if you will. So, sure. Um, so I think I, again, you didn't inhale. I think is what you were saying. Uh, there was such an easy Clinton <laughs> joke there, but uh, the idea being that there's multiple types of processing processors, right? Uh, growers processors, right. and there are processors that essentially are processing the oil. Uh, the THC oil, and when you get to that level of extraction, there are byproducts versus, you know, grow and then cut, you know, and, and ship. And when you're growing, cutting, and right. shipping versus getting down to the uh, producing specific byproducts, it's a it's sort of a non-issue. Is that essentially what you were trying to explain? Yes, that, that's correct. So anyway, um, I'd like to admit um, the email exchange from Mr. Peck and myself into the record uh, tonight. Essentially what it's saying is, is if they're not extracting, uh, he doesn't, the Department of Ecology doesn't have any concerns. Excellent. So we can make that exchange of emails exhibit 13. Uh, and then my final exhibit um, is that uh, we're required um, under the city code to uh, get a water availability certificate from the Tumwater Public Works Department. And so we did apply online and uh, 
we have that water availability letter uh, authored by uh, Ms. Carrie Gillum, Water Resource Specialist with the City's Public Works Department. So we'd like to enter that into the record. Great. Um, we'll go ahead and make that Exhibit 14. Uh, and this, I guess, could be a, a bit of a higher uh, higher use in terms of higher usage, more water being used than had previously been used. Uh, and and the city and county authorities, I, I'm sure, well, and state authorities uh, and federal authorities in terms of water uh, have certain requirements, but at, at the base permit level, water availability uh, certificate is required. So that will be exhibit yeah. four. Yeah, clearly. I mean, I don't know a lot about the the operation, but you know these these uses, the previous uses that were in these building were more industrial related. There was a sawmill, and and the middle building, I believe, is occupied currently by a uh, engineered wall system manufacturer. Um, and so, you know, basically, there there isn't a whole lot of water use um, with those uses other than just the bathroom. So the, obviously, the plants need water to grow. Now it's my understanding and talking with with Amid, the operator. They do have state of the art, um, you know, because water is expensive. Um, you know, they try and minimize and they try and do the right thing from an environmental perspective as well in terms of conservation. They do have a state of the art uh, irrigation system uh, uh, for plan for or the, in the existing facility and plan for the uh, the future facilities. Okay, great. And again, Exhibit 14 will be that certificate. A anything further? Um, no, I just we've we've read the staff report. Another thing that uh, Tammy and I are going to hash out, we uh, we uh, concur with the recommended conditions. And uh, if you have any other questions of me, feel free no. to ask. I, I don't, to the extent that we've been dealing with them as we've gone through. And so just so that make sure you. The applicant understands what I was proposing. I was proposing I didn't see any major issues with the recommended conditions uh, in the staff report, uh, other than I was going to make a slight alteration to that first recommended condition that essentially says, you know, uh, that the applicant shall you know, comply with the formal site plan review approval from October 13, 2023, except as later amended by agreement of staff and the applicant. That, that was the one major change. I And everything else thus far, you know, obviously I reserve the right if I see something uh, as I, I finalize a decision, but I, I didn't see anything else that jumped off the page at me. Is that track, Mr. Carlson, with your understanding? Yes. Excellent. Okay, uh, did your team there have anything further they wanted to add? No. No. Sorry, that no, okay. Uh, and uh, then I, at this point, uh, I'll go back to city staff, Tammy Merriman, anything you wanted to clarify, discuss, finalize at this point? No, not at this time. I appreciate the back and forth and making sure we get this all under control. I mean, I'll be honest. I remember some of these permits three, four, however many years ago uh, were quite a bit more, more. let's just say more controversial. I'll leave it at that. Uh, but uh, with that, I, the only other person I see that's joined appears to be a reporter. Uh, so if that's incorrect, please verify, but they've identified themselves as sort of news. So I don't believe they will be testifying. So um, they can hit the raise hand feature if I'm wrong. But otherwise, my intent is we'll, we'll go ahead and close the record and uh, I will produce a, a decision here on the proposal uh, uh, in the next couple of weeks is the intent. So. Uh, thank you all very much. Uh, have a pleasant evening. And, and again, appreciate uh, all, all the hard work everyone put in. Thanks, folks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.